you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you, did you read the Bible, memorize the Bible, believe the Bible, or understand the Bible? The question is going to be, did you do the Bible? Amen? The question is going, you're going to be judged by the fruit you produce, not the principles you understand. And when we live an encounter-free Christianity, we are continually adding manageable doses of the things of this world to try to make ourselves fit into a culture we're supposed to turn around. Amen? It was not my job to win friends and influence people. It's my job to win souls and influence demons. And you cannot do both. You're either going to win the popularity contest or you're going to turn hell's agenda inside out. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. I was going to preach last night about a mama's intervention, Devin, but I didn't get the time to, so we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get into some of that tonight. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. She doesn't even know how to answer the question because she's countering her answer with the description of what she has in the house. He said, what do you have in the house? And she said, nothing but a jar of oil. Well, do you have nothing or a jar of oil? Because a jar of oil is not nothing, but sometimes what you've got left over after the storm seems so insignificant that you are discounting something that if God ever multiplied it, it'd have the power to turn your situation around. The reason we discount the little bit that we have is because we live in such a natural, normal Christian experience that we do not release the necessary faith to believe five loaves and two fish is enough. They came and said, we only have five loaves and two fish. And Jesus, within five loaves and two fish, saw the ability to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. He saw that within 12 people, one of them who would doubt him, one of them who would cuss him and deny him, and one of them would sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, and a couple of them, you'd never hear of them doing anything for him again. He believed that he could multiply that group of people into an army that would take the known gospel, take the gospel to the known world in less than 20 years. So God is always looking to take what you have, regardless of how insignificant it may seem, and put it into the hands of God until the hands of God begins to cause little to become something extraordinary. That's why the Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. Because God begins something, always God begins something in seed form. And we don't do well with this. We need something to be at maximum yield in 33 seconds because that's how long it takes me to get my hamburger. So we live in a culture of microwaves. God lives in a culture of farming. The issue is our culture is killing us. We live in a culture where we are demanding things quickly and things that you can eat quickly have been through a processing period that have robbed them of what is necessary to bring maturity. Jesus. So we have to go back to the place where we are willing to participate in the process of seed time and harvest. And you gotta be careful that you don't say that so quickly that you miss the break between the seed and the harvest called time. Seed, time, and harvest. So we have in this story a woman who is asked what she has in the house, and she says, I don't have anything, verse 2, but a jar of oil. Then he said, Elisha said to her, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. When you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Say, outpouring. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay the debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. I believe she could have caused an entire community to be absolved of every debt they had had she planned big enough. 
Come on, that's the last principle, but I'm going to show it to you in the beginning. Had she borrowed enough vessels, and instead of believing for God to deliver her household, believed that her pain was going to produce an opportunity for her to deliver an entire nation, it could be that that woman could have stayed in that room for days with an upside-down jar watching God multiply the oil. But we live in a culture where we want just enough for us. And I've, I've heard ignorant preachers try to preach everybody debt-free when the Bible doesn't call you to be debt-free. It calls you to be a lender. Debt-free is selfish. Y'all are quiet. There are people living up under a bridge drinking out of a brown paper bag who are debt-free. See, all the poor people think it's the rich people who are selfish, but sometimes when you got kingdom principles and you're still broke, you're the selfish one. I can tell I'm leaving on a jet plane going somewhere because I feel a little something in here. See, you've got to not get enough for you so that you've got a little flame burning in you so that you feel better and so you don't need alcohol anymore. You need to get such a tremendous burning on the inside of you that God so sets you free that he then uses you to orchestrate the deliverance of somebody else. But we live with this narcissistic gospel. This secular humanism has invaded the church and we say, oh God, help me. Oh God, help me and give me my breakthrough. And right now, God, I need breakthrough and I need breakthrough right now. And did I tell you, God, that I need breakthrough right now? And God is trying to process you in a season where you recognize that if you get your breakthrough and do not have a revelation that you so broke through that now you can break somebody else out, then you miss the whole point of why you went through the pain. This is what Jesus says to Peter. He says, Simon, anytime he want to mess with Peter, he calls him Simon again. That's good. Just study that sometimes. So he says, Simon, the devil has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. And then Jesus said, but I prayed for you. And I didn't tell him to stop. That's what I'm thinking. Jesus, if you know the plans of the devil are to sift me as wheat, when you pray for me, tell him no, 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 stop. But he did not do that. He said, the devil has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Come on, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So let patience do her perfect and entire work that you may be lacking and wanting in nothing. That's not one of them verses you tape on your dashboard and drive to work, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. So he said, I prayed for you, Peter, that when the devil tries to have his way with you, you would have enough faith to survive it. This is what he said. So that when you come through this, you'll be able to reach back and strengthen your brethren. The process of, my God, of God walking you through what God walked you through is to qualify you to reach back into somebody else's storm and say, if he can bring me out, he can bring you out. And it's frustrating to be around people that had a season where God moved but do not know how to live a lifestyle where God moves. This woman was a part of a community that are called the Sons of the Prophets. These were a, a group of people who decided to live in community together and to have a couple of things in common. They wanted to submit themselves, first of all, to spiritual authority. And then they wanted to live a disciplined lifestyle where they would learn more about how to hear the voice of God. These were called the sons of the prophets. They're located initial, initially at Gibeah and Naoth under Samuel's supervision, 1 Samuel 10, 10, and 1 Samuel 19 and 20. I'm going to give these to you quickly. Later, another such group is referenced in 1 King 18, 4, when Obadiah hides the sons of the prophets to keep them safe from the murderous hands of Jezebel. Second, uh, thirdly, there's a group a community set up at Gilgal, 2 Kings 4, 38 through 44. And this particular community is also given to an atmosphere of discipline learning. And in 2 Kings 6, 1 through 4, there's another account of the building of one of these communities of sons of the prophets under the government of Elisha. This is what we talked about last night when we talked about how after Elijah is taken into heaven, the sons of prophets don't know what happened to him. 
because they were following from a distance. You'll never have a revelation of a change of dimension as long as you follow God from a distance. They thought Elijah had been taken away. Elisha knew he'd just been taken up. Good Lord, have mercy. So they are over on the mountain trying to figure out where Elijah is. And Elisha knows where Elijah is because he was not watching it from a distance. He was following closely. Peter gets in a mess when Jesus is on trial because he tries to follow close enough to make himself feel better, but not close enough to be indicted. This is a picture of the modern Christian church. We want to walk close enough so we don't feel like we've turned our back on God, but we don't want to walk so closely that it affects our reputation. So when they show up to Peter, Peter said, yes, I'm here, but I'm not with him. And then after he denies Jesus and the cock crows, Jesus turns and locks eyes with Peter, showing you that Peter was close enough to come to Christ's defense. Jesus said, this is crazy. I don't know if I'm going to get back. This is crazy. Jesus, there's some stories in here. Jesus is asked about his teaching and his doctrine. And Jesus said, don't ask me. Ask the ones who heard me. I always spoke openly. Always preached in the synagogue and in public. Ask the ones who heard me. And one of the men with the high priest takes the palm of his hand and strikes Jesus in the face. He says, you're going to answer the high priest this way? And I'm no, I know Peter's in the room. I studied the story. And I keep waiting for the Peter I know and love. I identify with Peter, I know, but I identify with Peter because Peter will cut somebody's ear off. God will fix it, but he'll cut an ear off right now in Jesus' name. And so, <laughs> and so when that dude hits Jesus in the face, I still keep reading the story because I know Peter is fixing to jump over somebody, take a stick out of the fire, and run it through that dude's right eyeball. He's fixing to get Jehud. I know what's coming. I read the story, and I'm going, here comes Peter. And Peter doesn't do anything when this man slaps Jesus in the face. You know what we do every time our culture defies our God and we don't have the courage to do anything about it? We watch them slap him in the face. Took prayer out of schools and we watched it. Made abortion legal and we watched it. Now homosexuals can get married in states all over the nation and we sat by and watched it and held hands and said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Peter wanted to be close enough to make himself feel better, but he did not want to be close enough to be indicted over his involvement. This is what we've done in modern religion. We said, come to church once a week for an hour and a half and you'll feel better. Matter of fact, we've got churches now that are gigantic from teaching people to think happy thoughts. The power of positive thinking. And we got glorified Dr. Phil standing in pulpits. We got people chewing their tongues up full of the devil, raping children, going to our churches and never falling under any conviction because we have leaders that have failed to use the standard of the Bible and said, this is what it means to, I wish somebody would help me on Sunday night. It's not the power of positive thinking. The purpose is not to make you feel better. It's to make you righteous. And if you'd start living holy, you'd start feeling better. But you're not supposed to feel better when you live in compromise. It's not my job to make you feel good. It's my job to tell you you're lukewarm and you're about to get puked out. 